Thank you very much, uh, Professor Roxburgh, for introducing me here. And um, it is my great uh, pleasure uh, to be here and uh, give my talk to such a wonderful audience um, at Harvard University. So um, let me start uh, my talk from now. So um, in December 1596, Sultan Mehmed III made a victorious return to Istanbul from his Hungarian campaign against the Habsburgs. This was the first expedition that had been personally led by a sultan since 1566, when Suleiman I marched to Hungary and died there during his campaign. After the heroic reign of Suleiman I, the Ottoman sultans were secluded and politically disabled to such an extent that they rarely stepped out of the Topka Palace and remained hidden within the impenetrable wall of the palatial complex. Therefore, the Sultan's triumphal return in uh, 1560 and 96 turned out to be a rare and momentous opportunity for the Ottoman government to display uh, their royal presence to the public. And um, this is Mehmed the third. Uh, the reception of Sultan Mehmed III was organized in a well-prepared manner. Two contemporary Ottoman historians, namely Selaniki and Abdul Qadir, record the series of ceremonials and festivities that took place within and outside of Istanbul in honor of the Sultan's arrival. Before the arrival of Mehmed III from Edirne, Safiye Sultan, his mother, and thus the most powerful figure in the court, moved to the recently renovated Daud Pasha Garden on the outskirts of Istanbul. Other members of court greeted the army on an open field nearby. Alongside them were merchants of the bazaar, Armenians, Jews, and Christians, uh, uh, who formed lines of approximately one kilometer was in a variety, uh, with a variety of textiles in their hands. After sacrificing animals at, oops, Edirnekap here, the party marched into Istanbul altogether. <coughs> For three days and three nights, lights illuminated the city and anchored ships while shops were decorated and the salute of guns roared. Soon after returning to the Topka Palace, the Sultan and his retinue paid a visit to the ancestral mausolea and Ayyub, where they made donations to the poor. This unique event raises several questions about the relationship between Ottoman ceremonials and urban structure at the turn of the 17th century. Was this a traditional way of welcoming a triumphal sultan? Why was the vicinity of the Daud Pasha Garden chosen as the first venue of reception? And were there any other ceremonial venues? What kind of I ideology and intention were behind the spectacle? Can we compare the Daud Pasha Garden to the Timurid suburban gardens of the 14th and 15th century in Central Asia? which inherited the personal Islamic garden tradition and was, were also used for imperial banquets. I would like to analyze this case from two different perspectives. First, royal suburban gardens in Ista Ottoman Istanbul need to be interpreted within their political and ceremonial context, since they played a significant role in the Ottoman court as well. Court ceremonials and imperial symbolism that seem to have once been assembled in the Topka Palace started to be partly disbanded and disseminated to the royal gardens from this period on. In addition to the above mentioned Daud Pasha Garden, um, I will discuss the Yuskudar Garden on the Asian side of Istanbul, which was also another hub of suburbia and ceremonial venue. Secondly, in addition to discussing the nature of the place itself, 
I will also suggest that the group of urban ceremonies programmed around these gardens should be interpreted as an endeavor to legitimize the Ottoman government in transition. As I will discuss in the end of this lecture, a comparative examination of Ottoman ceremonials in the 16th century reveals that the social strata of participants, or at least those who are explicitly mentioned in chronicles, did change significantly in the latter half of the 16th century. Imperial ceremonials became more open to the public and involved townsmen who actively uh, took part in the parade and assembly. Oops. And um, militaristic dramaturgy was another key part of ceremonials in the period. The demilitarization of the sultan in reality was complemented by a ceremonial and fictional rendering as the sultan as warrior. For example, the sword guarding ceremony of the new sultan in Ayyub, another Istanbul suburb, was actually an invented tradition of the early 17th century, which started to be documented from the succession of Osman II in 1618. As new royal complexes in Sababia, both the Daud Pasha and the Yuskidar Garden provided an important space for the redefined Ottoman urban ceremonials, which could not be installed into the existing facilities, such as the Topka Palace, since it was regulated by a rigid set of ceremonial protocols and the buildings corresponding to them. At the end of the 16th century, Istanbul uh, boasted uh, dozens of suburban gardens that fringed the Bosporus. Several others were located along the Sea of Marmara or were built inland, like the Daud Pasha Garden here. Uh, classical work by Erdogan gives the distribution and the approximate dates of construction for the gardens as shown here. Most of the gardens date back to the 16th century, except for several examples built previously. In fact, a substantial number of these Ottoman gardens share their locations uh, with the Byzantine ones, whereas the em emperors as well enjoyed a temporary stay away from the capital Constantinople. So, for example, the plot of a palace at Kalkedon here, today is uh, Kadukyoi. On the Asian shore, later became the Fener Garden in the Ottoman period. A further strike case is a set of palaces installed at Hebdomo here, <coughs> seven miles west of the city on the shore of the Marmara Sea, close to the location of the Daud Pasha Garden, up here. Being more ceremonial than recreational, Hebdomon was the campsite where the imperial army assembled for a campaign in Europe. And the emperors, such as Marcian, uh, Valens, Arcadius, uh, Theodosius II, and Leo I, were all proclaimed by the army at Hebdomon. And even up to today, <laughs> the strategic uh, strong points of the city uh, have remained almost unchanged and similar ceremonies have been performed at the same places throughout history. So uh, maybe all of you know, um, this is here, uh, President Erdogan in Turkey and after the attempted coup on uh, um, 15th of July, he returned from uh, Antalya to the Istanbul airport where he met with these uh, people gathered to welcome him. And let us now return to Ottoman Istanbul again. Um, Gülü Nezipolu scrutinized these 16th century royal garden complexes, Hasbahçe, and concluded that, I quote, the relatively small royal kiosks of 16th century were meant to be intimate private retreats where the sultan could escape from ceremonial constrictions. Istanbul's extensive belt of royal gardens, which expanded the ruler's personal domain, 
beyond the nucleus of the Topka Palace into the suburbs, no doubt projected a potent image of power and royal magnificence." End of quote. So according to her view, they were, I quote, intimate semi-formal gardens, end of quote, which rarely functioned as political and ceremonial venues. A sultan and his limited number of attendants frequently visited the coastal gardens by boats only for a short stay. Since there is no existing example of a garden from this period, except for remnants of a couple of um, individual pavilions built within garden complexes, we have to reconstruct a schematic plan of a garden from written documents. The Yuskidar Garden was one of the Sultan's favorite retreat, retreats due to its um, close proximity to the Topka Palace. In the 1560s, an account of repairs shows that uh, the garden complex had a large main palace, a kitchen, jasmine balustrades, a courtyard for yogurt makers, a large co outer courtyard, an cellar, ice cellar, and dormitories for uh, greyhound keepers and gardeners. Later account books also include several other pavilions named after the buildings. So this is a um, paint, uh, drawing from the late 17th century. So we, we can um, find out several uh, pavilions as uh, listed in the written documents. And this set of buildings were also described by a German traveler, Stefan Gerlach, who visited the garden in March 1576. <coughs> After bribing a gardener, he and his companions were permitted to enter the complex surrounded by a high wall. Uh, actually, we do not see a wall here, but um, maybe uh, it must be around here, where they found a beautiful planted garden with several buildings and a pool under construction. The main big building with a dome was referred to as a king's house, ein Königliches. Uh, Königliches House, which according to the gardener, was used by the sultan for dining and sleeping. It seems plausible that the buildings uh, listed in the written documents all belonged to the private section of the court, not being designed for the official ceremonial, such as an audience or a council. Most of these suburban gardens were landscape gardens and lacked geometric regularities, a fact which indicates the stylistic discontinuity between the Ottoman gardens and the contemporary Perso Islamic gardens. Unlike the colossal Timurid suburban gardens, in which royal tents were constructed for imperial banquets, their Ottoman counterpart in Yuskudar was a relatively modest and intimate space for the Sultan and a limited number of attendants. Um, several Ottoman chronicles testify the frequent visits of the sultans to the Yuskidar garden. During the summer of 1595, for example, Sultan Mehmet spent almost all his time there. Using the construction of a new hammam in the Topka Palace starting in July as an excuse, he and his close family members, Dalio Sade, moved to the Yuskidar garden. Their stay was prolonged until the beginning of October, when they transferred to the Istanbul or, uh, transferred to the Istanbul Old Palace at Bayezid because of the ongoing construction in the Topka Palace. And in order to conduct the mandatory court ceremonials, Mehmed III was obliged to return to the Topka Palace periodically. During his long summer vacation, such occasions include several petitions, ars, as the uh, chamber of petition, ars in the third court of um, the Topka Palace, where the Grand Vizier and other officials kissed the hand of the Sultan and reported the decision as the Imperial Council, the event. Um, so actually this is 
the uh, a scene of arts uh, in the uh, late 18th century. And uh, since there is a foreign delegate here, the uh, sort of uh, way of holding uh, the ceremonial of petitions is a little bit different, but uh, we can at least understand the atmosphere, how it was uh, performed in the Topka Palace. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, major court ceremonials in the Topka Palace had been codified in detail by Mehmed II's Codex of Laws, Kanunname, most probably uh, enacted in the late 1470s. Arts or petitions were to be performed four times a week at the Chamber of Petition here. However, judging from the description of Selaniki's chronicle, which exhaustively records events, Mehmet III evaded this duty by receiving only two petitions a month in the summer of 1595. Unable to perform the ritual petition in the Yuskida garden, which utterly lacked the space for the official ceremonials, the Sultan had to return to the Topka Palace, though sporadically. At the same time, this case indicates the plastic nature of Mehmed II's Kanunname, whose rigid regulations could be reinterpreted and mitigated in order to correspond to the transition of Sultan's political status and the diversification of his whereabouts. While the Yuskida Gardens in the proximity of the Topka Palace were the semi-private pleasure garden, lacking the space of political functions, the Daud Pasha Garden on the European side did include some political functions and buildings. After his visit to the Yuskida Garden in 1595, Mehmed III chose the Daud Pasha Garden as his summer retreat, both in uh, 1597 and 1598. During 1596, he was absent from the capital because of the Hungarian campaign, which was followed by the victorious return and ceremonial at the Daud Pasha Garden. What may uh, the Daud Pasha Garden, different from the rest of coastal gardens along the Bosphorus, was its distance from the Topka Palace. Since it was impossible to make a round trip in a single day, the Sultan did not return to the Topka Palace for the petitions. After moving to the Daud Pasha Garden in July 1597, uh, he stayed there throughout the month. Instead, the Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha had to visit the garden complex to make a report, cancelling a scheduled imperial council the next day. We can observe several other occasions when court officials, such as the Grand Vizier or Sheikh Ul Islam, were invited to the Daud Pasha Garden for audiences, banquets, and honorific robing of Hilat. The only occasion when the Sultan returned to the Topka Palace was for the celebration of Eid al-Adha, or the sacrifice feast, which had to be celebrated with the court members and a large group of Janissaries in the second courtyard of the Topka Palace. Of course, there arose a severe criticism against the Sultan's absence and transplantation of the audience function to the Daud Pasha Garden. In the summer of 1597, several freshly appointed officials could not perform their regulated audience with the Sultan at the Chamber of Petitions in the Topka Palace before departing for the uh, place of their post, Egypt. Intellectuals disapproved of the Sultan's delinquency in this manner and saw it an evil omen, saying, I quote, uh, if a holder of rank does not kiss a, a propitious uh, uh, coat tail of the caliph of his land and time, he would not be happy and will soon be dismissed. Alife is a man of the man, has let Lelinin Damendi, is that in a useful mese, Sahibi Mansu Beremend all my putis, Munfasl, all you tatayuli killer. End of quote. So, we can see that there existed a certain degree of opposition and tension regarding the outlation of court ceremonials during the period. 
An architecture analysis of the Dalpasha Garden also corroborates its uh, politicization. According to an account of repairs in 1703, the garden complex consisted of the council hall, the Ivanhane, the country privy chamber, Tashradaki Hasoda, and the pavilion of the holy mantle, Hulkai Sadet Dairesi. Here, the term council hall is a little tricky and must be interpreted as a chamber of petitions or an audience hall for two reasons. First, as the case studies of Mehmed III's stay in the suburban gardens reveal, the council hall of the Topka Palace was the only legal venue for the imperial councils, which were never transplanted to the other royal facilities in this period. This, is, uh, this was mostly due to the large number of bureaucrats that could not accompany the sultans to the gardens and who had to process and document in the Topka Palace. Second, the chamber of petitions in the Topka Palace had several names, including the council hall of the inner court, Divanhane Enderun. So the Divanhane of the Dalpasha Garden must have been a building for the sultan's semi-private consultations, not the public councils. With this in mind, I suggest that the above-mentioned set of buildings in the Dalpasha Garden in 1703 had their counterparts in the inner court and the room in the Topka Palace. Being frequently visited by the sultans and their attendants, the Dalpasha Garden began to be embellished by specific building types modeled after the Topka Palaces and the room. Here. On the other hand, any architectural elements from the outer court, Birun, such as the council hall or the ceremonial courtyard, are hardly detectable in the Dalpasha Garden. The omission of these spaces is also corroborated by the fact that Mehmed III had to return to the Topka Palace both in 1597 and 1598 for the sacrifice feast which should have been celebrated in the second courtyard here of Bilum. And the inner court was not only a private space for the sultan and his close courtiers, but also a semi-political venue as the existence of the chamber of petitions reveals. It was most probably uh, starting at the end of 16th century that the Dalpasha Garden began to be shaped as an imitation of the, uh, of the Topkap's inner court. This is supported by the fact that before the ceremonial return of Mehmed III from the Hungarian campaign, his mother Safiye entered the recently built imperial pavilion in the Dalpasha Garden. A result of this renovation is still visible as the only uh, remaining structure of the whole complex today. It is a two-story stone building called Tashkasru or Tashkoshk, namely the stone pavilion, which now functions as a reception hall at the Dalpasha campus of the Yultis Technical University. The domed audience room of the building is a hole of 10 meters square on the second floor. So this is the reception hall. The relatively moderate dimensions of the space were similar, were, are similar to those of the chamber of petitions in the Topka Palace, an intimate rectangular room of 7 by 9 meters. Although an extensive renovation of the garden complex was ex executed during the reign of Mehmed IV in the latter half of the 17th century, the stone pavilion built at the end of the previous century for political audiences marked the commencement of the politicization process of the suburban gardens in Istanbul. Without doubt, the Topka Palace has had been the political and ceremonial nucleus of the Ottoman court since its foundation by Mehmed II. 
Its elaborate spatial organization reached its apex during the reign of Sleiman I, when the new council hall, the Ivanhane, was constructed next to the second courtyard. While the outer court functions and building types were dedicated to the Topka Palace, the inner court elements were gradually grafted onto the suburban gardens following the uh, peripatetic life of sultans starting at the end of the 16th century. So thus, the Daud Pasha Garden became a semi-public royal venue. How then was the victorious return of Mehmed III mentioned at the beginning of talk organized? The venue for this urban ceremonial was in fact not the garden per se, but an open plot called Daud Pasha Sahrasa, the field of Daud Pasha, in front of the garden. The stone pavilion here was a mid-scale building which could only host, host uh, meetings and sojourns for limited numbers of people, such as a gathering of, queen, of the Queen Mother and court officials before the Sultan's arrival. It shared the impenetrable nature of the inner court in the Topka Palace, where only privileged had access. By no means, were a flock of townsmen allowed to enter the royal complexes. In opposition to the seclusion of the Ottoman sultans, as underscored by Nejipolu, Boyar and Fleet put forward an antithetic interpretation of the sultans. According to them, I quote, the view of an increasingly distant and remote ruler does not represent the reality of the sultanic power as displayed in Istanbul or reflected in the Ottoman accounts. Highly visible, the sultan constantly appeared before the Istanbul populace, who addicts uh, of spectacle and pageantry were uh, continually involved in one way or another in imperial pomp and display." End of quote. Such contradictory concepts can be integrated as follows. While in almost all the daily ceremonials within the Topka Palace, the sultans were hidden from view. Their presence was overtly manifested outside the palace through urban ceremonials and processions performed on various occasions. In this way, the imperial manifestation of sultans on the streets or open fields balanced their seclusion in the palace. Avoiding the rigid regulations of the Codex of Mehmed II, the venues of the spectacles should be established beyond the walls of the Topka Palace. The dichotomy of seclusion and manifestation was projected on two types of space respectively. The urban ceremonials where the sultans were present include the circumcision festival, Friday prayer procession, the new sultan's visit to the mausolea of ancestors and Abu Ayyub, the, uh, the patron saint of Istanbul, and of course the departure and return of military campaigns. The grandest example is the circumcision festival of uh, Prince Mehmet, uh, Prince Mehmet uh, later, uh, who is later to be uh, Mehmet III as a sultan, in 1582, which is celebrated by the Istanbul populace for almost two months with numerous demonstrations and parades at Atmeydane, the former Hippodrome Square in central Istanbul. The ceremonial in the vicinity of the Daud Pasha Garden was another urban sultanic representation. So this is a scene from uh, Friday prayer procession, and this is uh, 1582, uh, um, circumcision party. Whereas the Yuskida garden itself was not used politically by itself, its vicinity became a venue of several military festivals on the Asian side of Istanbul. Just like its counterpart in the European side, the Yuskida garden had an open field in front, namely Haidar Pasha Sahrasa, the open field of Haidar Pasha. 
This became the assembly point of the Ottoman army, which is frequently dispatched to suppress the Jelali revolts in Anatolia from the end of 16th century. Not only for the Jelali revolts, but also for the revolt of the Jambrats in Syria and the Safavid campaign starting in 1603, the army usually led by the Grand Vizier departed eastward from Haidar Pasha. And of course, today we have Haidar Pasha station for trains departing eastward. A close look at the military dispatch in the summer of 1607 reveals that this was more an elaboratory designed urban ceremonial for the Istanbul populace than a conventional departure of the army. A series of parades, banquets, and councils were performed for more than a month on both sides of the Bosphorus Strait. Commissioned as the commander of the expedition, the Grand Vizier Murat Pasha crossed the strait to encamp on the field, the open field of Haidar Pasha in June 1607. The enormous crowd of tents included that of the head of Janissaries, the financial officers, and the head of security, as well as the servicemen. In the city of Istanbul, across the city, a parade of guild members, of merchants, butchers, bakers, and grocers passed in front of a royal pavilion of the Topka Palace, celebrating and praying for the safety of the army. Despite encamping on the Asian side, several officers from the expeditionary force soon returned to the Topka Palace for an audience and honorific robing by Sultan Ahmed I following a military parade within the city led by the Grand Vizier. For the next stage of the ceremonial, the adolescence, uh, adolescent Sultan himself moved to the Yusukudar Garden, though he himself would not lead the army. The vicinity of the garden turned into a venue for the Imperial Council where tents of Chief Judge of Anatolia, Kada, uh, Anadol Kazaskele, the Chief Sergeant of the court, and the Ministry of Finance were settled. Besides processing orders for the expedition, the court officials judged the mandate complaints from the public and criminals. Thus, the political function and symbolism of the Imperial Council was now transplanted to a suburban setting along with the court officials and the Sultan away from the Topka Palace across the strait. Whereas the Sultan himself probably did not appear to the council which conforms the Sultanic seclusion in the Topka Palace, his presence would have been obvious to the people gathered in the vicinity of the Yuskida Garden. Though on a lesser scale, similar pageants of departures were organized at the same place almost every year in the beginning of the 17th century when political turmoil caused the Ottoman Empire. The Yuskida Garden of, and the open field of Haidar Pasha were hence integrated into a series of, of ceremonial venues in Greater Istanbul. There is no doubt that the existence of the garden was a prerequisite when selecting a ceremonial garden, albeit the space of the garden itself was never employed for the public ceremonials in both Daud Pasha and Yusukudar. The two elements, a royal private garden and an open field by its side, functioned as a whole, while the former substituted as the inner court of the Topka Palace, the latter served in place of the outer court and intramural squares for ceremonials. The new Ottoman legitimization strategy in the latter half of the 16th century is reflected in the social class of the participants and dramaturgy of these festivals. To put it in another way, the Ottoman ceremonials started to gain greater militaristic aspects with more plebeian participants after the reign of Suleiman I. When compared to the series of military departures and returns discussed here, the return of Selim I to Istanbul in the summer of 
1518 reveals a surprisingly different attitude of the time for this epochal event. Selim's uh, conquest of the Mamluks, uh, the long-time formidable enemy of the Ottomans, and the resulting annexation of Syria, Egypt, and the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, without doubt established the Ottoman domination in the eastern Mediterra Mediterranean world as a protector of the two holy cities. Nevertheless, contemporary chronicles do not report any urban ceremonies following Selim I's triumphal return. After spending only several days in the Topka Palace, Selim I soon departed for Edirne, where his crown prince, Sleiman, was posted during the campaign. Like his father's return, the departure of ceremonial uh, the departure ceremonial of Sleiman I in 1521 for the campaign against Belgrade was conspicuously simple. A chronicle record only tells us that he and the army visited the ancestral mausolea and the holy shrine of Abu Ayyub without any festivities involving the Istanbul populace. After the death of Sleiman in 1566, his son Selim II returned to Istanbul. This event is narrated by Selaniki, who describes not welcoming plebeians or magnificent pro uh, processions, but an episode of havoc led by rebellious Janissaries. It seems that the departure and return of military campaigns were never celebrated and arranged as urban ceremonies with elaborate dramatic interpretation in these days. The, lat, uh, the later militaristic representations in Dalpasha and Yuskuda were not the traditional way of magnifying the triumphal sultans from the golden age of the empire, but were in fact a well-organized celebration that hammered out a fictitious image of four-year sultan. This also accords with the fabrication of the sword guarding ceremonial of the new sultan at the holy shrine of Abu Ayyub in one of Istanbul's suburbs, starting in 1618. As in the tale of King Arthur and Excalibur, the act of guarding a legendary sword articulates the legitimacy and military strength of the ruler. It is surprising that no contemporary documents even hint at the existing existence of such a sword until Osman II's enthronement in the early 17th century, though his ancestors had paraded through Istanbul to visit the shrine. The sword guarding was apparently one of the invented traditions and ceremonials to underline the image of the warrior sultan at the turn of the 17th century. This process of dramatization and militarization was accompanied by the popularization of the ceremonials. According to Terziolu, who analyzed the circumcision festival in 1582, I quote, elite and commoner partake in much the same way in the domain of laughter, end of quote, during this festival. At Meidane was turned into a venue of parades and banquets in which the members of girls participated, while the sultan observed the scene from a uh, belvedere in the Vlahim Pasha palace adjacent to the square. The streets of Istanbul also became a venue for various performances where according to Terziolu, I quote, ordinary spectators were much closer to the performers and may have even found themselves in the midst of various spectacles, end of quote. The ceremonials in the vicinity of suburban gardens demonstrate similar activities involving the general populace. On the other hand, early circumcision festivals were highly elite affairs. For example, the listed participants of the circumcision festival in 1457 were religious scholars, Sufis, local officers, and foreign delegates. A, city, uh, a series of banquets, honorific robings, and fireworks were organized for these participants over the course of more than a week, while the participation of townsmen is barely mentioned in the chronicles of Kemal Pashazadeh, Ashk Pashazadeh, and Neshri. 
Even if you account for the author's elitist background, the absence of the populace in the chronicles indicates the intimate and exclusively nature of the festival in the 15th century, which reminds us the banquets, resm, uh, in the Timurid gardens. So um, based on this discussion, I can conclude now that the unique event of Sultan Mehmed III's victorious return in 1596 was the outcome of three architectural and ceremonial transitions that took place in the late 16th century following a new Ottoman political reality. The first architectural transition was the semi-public uh, publicization of suburban royal gardens, which used to be private and secluded. The Sultan's frequent stays in these gardens and their long absence from the Topka Palace made it necessary to construct several building pipes that could accommodate the daily uh, court ceremonies, such as receiving an audience. The new constructions that appeared in the uh, Daud Pasha Garden were actually a, a duplication of the Topka Palace's inner court, which functioned both as Sultan's private quarters and a semi-public sphere for an audience. Although the royal garden complex itself never became a venue for festivals, the open field next to it acquired a ceremonial character. The second transition was the uh, militaristic dramaturgy of urban ceremonials from this period on. The politically and militaristically disabled Ottoman sultans were presented uh, in the guise of a mighty ruler and were thus legitimized through their ceremonials. This process was accompanied by the third transition, popularization. This trend entirely reorganized the former ceremonials for the Ottoman elite circle. The Istanbul populace actively took part in the new ceremonials as participants, not passive onlookers as they used to be. For such urban ceremonials incorporating a mass of participants, the traditional uh, ritual venue, uh, the Topka Palace, with rigid regulations could not meet the new demand. Located as the historical strategic points of Istanbul, Sababia, the vast fields of Daud Pasha and Yusküdar provided ideal venues for the Ottomans who were seeking a new way of representing their rulership at the turn of the 17th century. Thank you very much. <laughs>